In this unit, we build on our causal loop diagrams that we just learned and begin practicing something called system archetypes. These are commonly occurring combinations of reinforcing and balancing feedback loops. System archetypes are also known as classic system stories because you'll see them <laughs> over and over again if you look. We learn system archetypes because once you're familiar, you'll be able to see these key relationships and perhaps identify interventions uh, to change the behavior of the systems. We'll learn more about that next. There are classic examples of character archetypes which are presented here, very Jungian concept. Um, but also patterns of behavior can be archetypical. Um, they're often repeated over and over again that we'll, we'll look at that uh, in a few minutes. Um, this idea of collective unconscious, uh, patterns of thoughts, uh, images, systems language, in systems language we call it uh, a mental model, uh, can be quite archetypical. Handout that's given with this course gives you some examples of many, many types of systems and archetypes which may uh, be interesting to you. We're going to look at a few that are uh, very useful in agricultural situations. Fixes or fails is the common one over and over again. And shifting the burden is a very common uh, personal archetype that we'll take a look at. And we'll have a homework on the tragedy of the commons. By now, you should understand how to read a causal loop diagram. For example, there'd be a problem which we describe as a symptom, really, of the situation. But as a problem increases, the easy fix increases. That is, moves in the same direction. As the easy fix increases, the problem goes away. That is, moves in the opposite direction. One example uh, that is quite often used is the problem is um, low income or hunger, and the easy fix is cheap food, such as Walmart, that now is the largest grocery store in the world, or at least in the U.S. As Walmart food sources increase, the problem solution goes away, it decreases that problem of lack of access to, to good food. Uh, the problem is with an easy fix, there's an unintended consequence. In the case of Walmart, uh, it's low wages. And as low wages increase, the problem of lack of food due to lack of income uh, increases again. And so you got a reinforcing feedback loop. Let's, let's take a look at this a little bit more closely. So we read this as financial stress. Um, due to low income uh, increases, food from Walmart increases, or corporate uh, food in general increases. As corporate food incre increases, um, financial stress decreases, moves in the opposite direction because we've got access to lower cost food. Well, that seems good. The problem is, in order to provide this low cost of food, we provide poor, low um, salaries for most of the labor force. About much of the U.S. Uh, labor force is involved in some aspect of the food system, and these are very, very uh, low paid jobs. Most of the jobs in the food system have low wages with low health care and little opportunity for advancement. And so that which is seemingly the solution is actually part of the problem. So back to our model, as the problem increases, the easy fix increases, easy fix increases, the problem temporarily goes away, at least in the short run. The problem is, as the easy fix increases, there's an unintended consequence that aggravates the problem. Let's take a look at what that looks like for Walmart. As financial stress increases, food from Walmart increases, moves in the same direction. As food from Walmart increases, the financial stress is temporarily relieved. We've got a balancing feedback loop. The problem is, as food from Walmart increases, the local businesses with union workers receiving a livable wage go out of business and wages go down. The Walmart effect not only makes cheap food, but drives wages down, not only at Walmart, but in all those competitive businesses. And as local, as union, union jobs disappear and wages go down, financial stress uh, increases. Um, so as, uh, and so the, the problem is aggravated. Here we're using Walmart as a metaphor for all of corporate food systems. Uh, and the questions are, as cheap food from Walmart is a short-term solution, right? This is a good thing. The problem is uh, cheap food from Walmart is a long-term cause of poverty. So is it a cause or is it a solution? Well, the answer is both. And we use the model to understand it. The short-term solution is in the top balancing feedback loop, and a long-term problem is in the lower um, reinforcing feedback loop. This, the uh, corporatization of our food system is both a short-term solution as well as a long-term problem. So if we're looking for solutions, we can use this model to try to understand 
how to address this problem? And the answer is twofold. We both address the short term as well as the long term. In the short term, perhaps SNAP benefits, certainly increasing our minimum wage, helps reduce this financial stress. We've got to deal with the immediate problem. We can't just ignore the immediate problem um, because it won't go away. But at the same time as we're dealing with this immediate problem of trying to solve this balancing loop, we need to look at some long-term structural changes. In this example, legislation to support unions, alternative food systems, you know, local food campaigns, education, food hubs, which are very efficient ways of providing food uh, from uh, high-quality local producers, uh, communities involved in helping uh, to develop local food systems. All of these things are long-term structural changes to address this problem of financial stress. So we do, we do both, both the short-term as well as the long term. And using Joanna Macy's uh, model of business as usual and the great turning, business as usual, which keeps things going, but do it more and do it faster and do it do it more more aggressively, um, is is the is the uh, this problem the solution is more cheap food, you know, um, and that's just not a that's that's not a viable solution in the long term. Um, in the long term, we need to understand the the identity of the root cause, which we use the iceberg for. We use systems modeling to understand the situation. We look for high leverage points for change. And we do a lot more to try to understand the structural problems that cause this short-term um, problem of, uh, of financial stress, uh, pushing us into finding Walmart a necessary solution. Well, are there other examples? You will see lots of pro examples of fix it fail once you understand how the model works. Let's take a look at a few. Here's a few. The more times we put out small forest fires, the more likely to have big ones. The problem is solution. The problem is the fire. The easy fix is to put it out. As the easy fix uh, is impl implemented, the fire goes out. The problem is trash builds up uh, and doesn't burn off. And when a big fire happens, it's a huge fire and causes a, a, a enormous uh, forest fire, particularly in the West. This happens over and over again. How about this one? There are too many accidents on a winding road, so you widen the highway, and there are more accidents. Why is that? Because you got a problem a problem of accidents on the road. You widen the road, and uh, the immediate solution might work. The problem is people drive faster and faster, uh, and the problem continues. U.S. foreign policy is to remove uncooperative dictators, which exposes underlying tensions of scarcity. We see this over and over again. You got a problem with we consider a, a dictator in a foreign country. What we do is remove that foreign dictator, and the solution might be temporarily relieved. But the problem is the uh, underlying scarcity of resources, erupting the violence, and over and over again. We see this uh, throughout the world, in re and we repeat the same mistake as a uh, uh, as a U.S. foreign policy over and over again. These are all fixes that fail. Uh, and, and with this model, we hopefully begin to understand uh, how this is working. So we could pro provide some longer term solutions um, and address root causes. Here's another archetype we see over and over. This is the escalation archetype. And this happens whether you're in your schoolyard uh, bragging about your family or as something as serious as nuclear weapons. An example is the clear uh, a statement by the past president, the United States must greatly strengthen and expand its nuclear capability in such a time as the world comes to its senses regarding nukes. Um, it hasn't worked in the past, uh, but maybe it'll work this time. Let's take a look at what the model looks like. So here we go. We'll start with other nations because we always point at other nations as the real source of the problem. As other nations' weapons and stockpiles increase, the, U the U.S. weapons superiority over other nations decreases, we lose ground. As U.S. superiority over other nations decreases, the perception of a threat increases, opposite direction, as perception of threat increases, we build more weapons, increases. As we have more weapons production, we increase our stockpile, increases, same direction. As the stockpile increases, the U.S. superiority over other nations increases. Well, that's all good until the other nations realize that U.S. weapons superiority over other nations increases. The other nations' perception threat increases, same direction. As other nations' perception of threat increases, their production of stockpiles of nuclear weapons, or any weapons for that matter, increases. And as other weapons, other nations' production increases, their stockpiles increase. And as their stockpiles increase, the U.S. superiority over other nations decreases, moves in the opposite direction, and we go round and round and round. And there's 
there's uh, no solution in the short term um, unless someone is willing to say, this is not working, folks. In the handout, you see a generic understanding uh, presentation of the escalation archetype, uh, always as one A's result increases, A's result, A's resistance. A's position relative to B changes. As A's position relative to B changes, um, the, the response from B changes over and over again. This archetype uh, we see um, throughout the world and schoolyards to um, nuclear, nuclear weapons. The solutions are to keep doing the same thing, but do it more. And you know that's quite often the, uh, um, the proposed solution uh, or trying a systems thinking tool. You know, we know from uh, Joanna Macy, that there are three ways of shifting of, of shifting systems. Uh, one is a holding actions, that is things that have to be done in the immediate term. Um, one is structural change, um, changing the organizations, the policies, etc. And the third is shift in consciousness. All three are necessary to see the great turning be implemented. Here's one you might find familiar and is related to one of our homeworks. Uh, this is called shifting the burden. Um, this is, uh, for example, we got a problem uh, with energy level. Our energy level is down. And so as our energy level goes down, our use of caffeine uh, goes up, moves in the opposite direction. As use of caffeine goes up, the energy level uh, goes up also moves in the same direction. We wouldn't do it if it didn't work. This is a balancing feedback loop. And in the short run, it works. The problem is, as we increase the use of caffeine, there's a side effect called dependency on caffeine to stay alert. As use of caffeine increases, dependency increases, dependency increases, the ener we stop doing energy enhancing activities like sleeping well and taking doing exercise. And as that as energy enhancing activities goes down, energy level goes down as well. And so we've got another balancing feedback loop. Um, at first, solving the problem, and at second. Um, secondly, um, causing a long, long-term problem because we don't address the fundamental root causes of the, of the uh, problem. We've shifted the burden from energy-enhancing activities dealing with energy level to something that uh, is addictive, such as caffeine. And all of these specific models can be shown in the more generic uh, archetypical model of problem solution resulting in a quick fix, a quick fix solving the problem temporarily, but the quick fix causing a side effect that prevents us from addressing the fundamental solution, which actually would be the better way um, to deal with the problem. And I'll bet you could model some of these, such as like catching up on homework by not sleeping and blasting through your homework as a uh, quick fix or borrowing money to cover <laughs> the, the debt you've got on another credit card being a quick fix or taking pain relievers to relieve relieve chronic pain pain being a quick fix these are not necessarily bad things to do if we as long as we recognize that they're short-term solutions and that we also have to implement a longer term fundamental solution at the same time my last example of a archetype is called a tragedy of the commons and i'd ask you to read more about this as a video uh, on the on the course web page that helps you understand the tragedy of the commons i'm going to ask you to model this yourself you're welcome to do a web search on the tragedy of the commons and get some help doing this um, in order to help you practice and learn more about this particular system archetype 